at these motivational posters. You might recognize them from grade school or something like that. Hmm. Interesting. You know, these words make me feel good. Never say never. Everything you need is already inside. You know what we should do with these? Throw them in the garbage. Because let's take a look at the words used in these posters again. Everything you need. Never say never. The problem is, they're complete absolutes. Never say never. I think it's okay to say never sometimes. I mean, I'm never going to eat a spider, and I think that's okay. And if everything I need is already inside, why would I study, exercise, do anything to better myself? It's almost like these motivational posters and quotes are designed to make us feel better about ourselves because of how certain they are. And because we, as people, are so insecure and unsure of everything, they don't ask us to accept any hard truths, but instead give us false validation. Now, if you're a college student like myself, you'll probably recognize some of the following rhetorical questions. Will my major be the right one for me? How do I balance school, sleep, and a social life? Or it could be as simple as, what would be the best thing to eat for lunch today? These questions rattle around my head constantly, and honestly, sometimes some false validation can be nice. Yet for the 19 years in my life, I've never been able to give a concrete answer to a single one of them. And it's certainly not due to a lack of thinking. These questions and my uncertainty in answering them illustrate the concept of uncertainty. Merriam-Webster defines uncertainty as a lack of sureness about someone or something. But as I was reading the book, The Subtle Art of Not Giving an F, by Mark Manson, I realized something. Uncertainty doesn't just mean lack of sureness, because personally, I don't think that that definition does the word justice. Here would be my definition for it. The foundation of human motivation. Now, before you look askance at me, and tell me I'm crazy, know that I'm a math major who's experienced in proving logical statements. So with this, here is what we're going to try to prove today. Acting upon uncertainty implies human motivation, or a motivation to be better. What we're going to try to prove with this statement is that when acting in uncertain situations, you might encounter embarrassment or, or failure. But that very embarrassment or failure can serve as the motivation for self-improvement. However, as any good math major knows, we need some tools and definitions in order to be able to progress from one step to the next to complete our proof. And while I'm in no way sponsored by this book, two quotes in it stood out as applying directly to our proof. One. The avoidance of suffering is a form of suffering. And two, don't just sit there, do something, the answers will follow. So today, we're going to take an in-depth look at each of these statements and apply them to our proof. And maybe, just maybe, we will be able to answer some of the rhetorical questions about your and my future. Now, I want you to raise your hand if there is something ordinary in life, be it sleeping, eating, running, working out, etc., that you just sat and told yourself, I'm just not going to be good at this. I see some raised hands, uh, me too. But for me, that thing was dancing. When I was little, I felt that I had two left feet. So I did my best not to dance in front of anyone. And I did my best not to think about it either. 
But that proved difficult when I went to a regional dance competition to support one of my dancer friends and saw how other people could move, how with unflinching confidence they danced in front of everyone. And me being the uh, raging narcissist, my thought process went a little something like this. Wow, can they dance? Too bad that'll never be you, Dennis. Why? Right, because you're too scared to dance in front of anyone and get judged. But that sucks. Yeah, but you can't dance, so you shouldn't. Right? And I remember being so frustrated with myself that I couldn't dance. And I had to just slouch in the corner at any social event watching other people enjoy themselves night after night. But about a year after the dance competition, I was invited to a friend's birthday party. Now, this friend's parents had rented out a clubhouse, and there was a dance floor, and people were, well, dancing, and it looked like fun. And I momentarily forgot why I don't let myself dance. On a whim, enchanted, I just rushed into the middle of the dance floor and joined in. You want to know something? It was fun! I know. Crazy, right? But I had fun, and I wasn't laughed out of the room. And then I realized in that moment that with all of the mental gymnastics I was doing in my own brain to justify never dancing, that process was more painful than actually growing some nards and just doing it. So, um, I've been dancing ever since. Onus on the dancing. I never said I was good at it. Kidding aside, I'm certain that there is something in each and every one of your lives that's analogous to what dancing was for me. And whatever that thing is, whatever thing you're purposefully trying to avoid for fear of embarrassment or failure, stop and think. Does avoiding this thing, does going out of my way to avoid this thing, really make sense? And is the comfort in the certainty of failure at this thing really better than the uncertainty of possibly getting better? You see, in my opinion, uncertainty in success is far more worthwhile than certainty in failure. Therefore, you must face the embarrassment, or in my case, dance in front of it, head on, rather than trying to avoid it and still suffering. Restated, that means you must act in the face of an uncertain situation. Or in other words, don't just sit there, do something. The answers will follow. When I read this, it was jarring because We've been taught the exact opposite for most of our lives. In school, you study, and then you take the test, not the other way around. Ergo, you need the answers to take action. However, as I've discovered, the, outside the scope of the classroom, this process is often reversed. And ironically enough, a great example of this is my personal growth in public speaking. In eighth grade, I was tasked with giving a speech about why I should be student forum president in front of our entire eighth grade class. Now, I had implanted into my mind that I had to be extremely funny, or I had no shot, regardless of the content, because as anyone knows, any student body election at that age is just a popularity contest. So I came up with this joke for the end of my speech. And I had no idea whether it was going to be funny, whether it would help me win the election or not, or even if it made any sense at all. And in the week leading up to the speech, I remember being racked with the struggle of telling it or not telling it. And at the very last moment, as I was giving the speech, in fact, I decided, why not? And I went for it. Okay. 
in a feeble attempt at showing humility, I decided to state how I only had three friends. And to illustrate that point, I decided to draw little faces on my fingers and yell, the gang's all here. You feel that? The cringe? The silence? Yeah. The next week was just shame and embarrassment. I was the butt of every joke that week. To be fair, though, I did look like this. So you know, fair is fair. However, instead of giving in and telling myself, you know, I'm just not going to be good at public speaking for fear of embarrassment, I decided to use this mistake as fuel. So when I entered Lasseter High School, go Trojans, I decided to join speech and debate. And through long hours spent working on numerous speeches, I was able to eventually formulate what had went wrong in that eighth grade speech. Humor should complement content, not replace it. And this lesson and the work I put in to learn it got put to the test immediately at graduation as I was scheduled to give a commencement speech. Oh, the nerves that day were intense as my eighth grade failure replayed in my mind. I remember being introduced, going up to the podium at an amphitheater at Kennesaw State University, now facing a crowd of 2,000 as opposed to 200 years prior. I expected the butterflies, the nerves, the anxiety to swell up. But it never came. I remember being on that stage and engaging the audience because my focus was on content this time. And because my humor was complimentary, I, believe it or not, even got him to laugh a few times. But had I hesitated way back when and not told that joke, I probably wouldn't have learned that lesson. Ergo, my moment of acting at my point of greatest uncertainty became my fuel to be a better public speaker because of the failure of that joke to land and my losing of the election. And that very mistake became the reason I gave an improved commencement address. And as a matter of fact, it's the reason I'm standing in front of all of you today talking about it. So had I had the chance to go back and redo, I wouldn't change a thing. Because uncertainty holds us back from going for it all for fear of the consequences, yet it's those consequences that often catalyze self-improvement. Now? We have the tools to complete our proof. First, when you act upon uncertainty, you might face possible embarrassment or failure. But as we've learned, the avoidance of this embarrassment or failure is a form of embarrassment or failure itself. So you should act and face it head on. Then, when facing this possible embarrassment or failure, if you subscribe to the idea that you do something and the answers will follow, you can use this embarrassment as motivation to be better, as motivation to improve. Hence, acting upon uncertainty implies human motivation. Now, how does this proof answer our rhetorical questions, you might ask? Well, I'm sorry to have strung everyone along for so long, but it actually doesn't. You probably will never have 100% certainty that you've answered all or any of your rhetorical questions correctly. And if you can't answer them, then I certainly can. And as a matter of fact, if I even try, I just become an animated version of those motivational posters I was mocking earlier. So that would be hypocritical. But to put a finer point on this proof, let me leave you with an anecdote about how it applied to my personal life. Recently, I was walking a friend back home to her dorm. And she turned and told me, and I'm not saying this to brag, but she said, you know, a lot of the jokes you tell are pretty funny. And you know what I told her in response? The truth. I have simply run out of unfunny jokes to tell. And for God's sakes, I mean, I was talking to my fingers, guys. So it was bad. 
But that's the point. The point is that I didn't know. I was uncertain whether my jokes would be funny. So I told them, and when I did, and bombed embarrassing myself, that became motivation for me to become funnier. And that's how powerful acting upon uncertainty can be. So my advice is to never answer your questions with 100% certainty. Instead, embrace the uncertainty of your own path and use it as fuel to grow and strive and get better. And if you're going to leave this with anything, let it be this. Embrace the uncertainty of life, then act because of it. Thank you.